one of the reasons I brought that Kerfilzmib regimen up was it has a very dramatic complete response rate. I think, if I recall rightly, almost two thirds of patients go into complete remission. And Dr. Zonder, do you think that's important for a patient heading for transplant, or does it not matter that much? Uh, I think depth of response that you all. You the depth of response that you ultimately reach is important, and um, whether or not you reach that in the first four cycles en route to transplant, I guess is not quite as clear. But I, I, I agree with you that the I think when you uh, compare uh, carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone to other proteasome inhibitor uh, uh, immunomodulatory uh, steroid combinations, it's the depth of response it's, it, it, that makes it, that sets it apart from those other regimens. So let me just push a little bit further on that question, which is if a patient enters a complete remission, you're a community oncologist, you've given them four cycles of VRD or KRD or CYBRD, do they still need to be referred to a transplant center or can you stop treatment then or keep going? What, what, what's the answer? I think the best answer is we don't know at this point. I think that is a, a common uh, uh, difficulty uh, that we, uh, that we uh, at academic centers and also community physicians are running into. Uh, I think what we, we do know uh, from multiple studies is that uh, transplant deepens response in a subset of patients who haven't achieved complete response before that. And we also have some data that shows that um, uh, patients who are in an apparent complete remission but who are not uh, MRD, minimal residual disease negative, pre-transplant become negative after transplant and achieving that degree of disease suppression also uh, uh, predicts outcomes later. So. Uh, do you agree with that, uh, Dr. Lonnie? Yeah, so uh, I guess I would, I would uh, spin that a little bit differently, and that is I think CR, as we currently define it, complete response, is only the middle of the iceberg, and we have a lot more work to go in terms of depth of response. So I think stopping after four, even if your patient achieves a CR, uh, is just asking the disease to come back. And so I would, I would consolidate that patient with a transplant and then talk about maintenance therapy because our goal is to get as low as you can. So, so that's two saying yes, send the patient for, tr even if you're in a complete remission because you don't believe it's truly a complete remission, send them for consolidation therapy of transplant. Let me get my colleagues over here to come because I think Jim might have a different opinion. So Jim, I will, uh, I will talk to the counter. Okay, you can have a debate here. But, uh, Dr. I Garrison, don't would you believe tell that, that depth of response in a clinic that has multiple opportunities for the patient. Certainly, we have data now, data on well over 300 patients I treat that has shown depth of response means absolutely nothing to a patient who can have many, many options. When you look at data generated that showing depth of response matters, it's in many parts of the world where there are few options, and then I believe depth of response means a lot. So in our clinic, we have no data to support that. I do believe ultimately that CR, strict CR, not the CRs as we heard of Sanger, means a lot. We're not there yet in 2014. We will be. So would you send this patient for transplant if you're uh, down the street from... from no, I would not. Uh, Sundar, what do you think? No, I, you know, the study we are quoting, Andrew Jacoboviak's frontline CRD, it was done and we were one of the signs. We did majority of the patient, once they were on the CRD and had very high complete response rate, we did not necessarily take them for transplantation. Right. Okay. And they was have the continued right to do, do well. They right have continued to do well. Right decision or wrong decision? The data, you know, it's a small 60 patient study, so you can't over-interpret it. But people, even with high-risk genetics, they went into complete remission. We know high-risk genetics was actually defined as high-risk poor prognosis in the era of transplantation, after transplantation. So this novel agent was able to put them into complete remission, and they continued to get that. So, that so, they so were still in remission. You're so, a transplanter. I am. So are you telling our audience that you don't, think somebody in a complete remission should be referred for transplant or are you just being No, neutral? I will say no, that's a very good question that you are putting me to a spot. I would say you are in complete remission. In general, the principle of transplant is you do it up front, you get maximum bang for the buck, so to speak, you will get. You use patients typically when they relapse, 
Those who defer transplant quite often do not like to go back to transplant either when they defer. Then they defer it multiple times. Then you do the transplant in much later, after two or more uh, relapses, the transplant doesn't accomplish much. So my general recommendation is if you're going through the trouble of collecting stem cell, et cetera, you seriously consider going through high dose therapy and stem cell transplant as part of the first permission. But the patient is, you know, is really adamantly against it, then at first relapse for sure. So I think, unless I'm misunderstanding, that's three in favor of a transplant referral and one would, would hold on to the patient and keep them on treatment. So let me ask uh, about this issue of complete remission just a, a little bit longer and we'll get to the issue of what people are starting to call continuous therapy but was called maintenance therapy. I mean, Jim, you, you, you didn't want to send your patient for transplant. Do you stop treatment or do you keep them on indefinitely or do you use minimal residual disease testing? Oh, uh, I heartily believe in non-stop therapy, but I think it has to be therapy that gives the patient a quality of life. And as long as we're giving a maintenance treatment that gives them a quality of life while they're receiving it, means it's continuous therapy in our clinic. And what do you do in your practice? You, you keep them on, what, what, I didn't think I asked you what you use in your front line. Yeah, I generally use Velcade-based therapy. Uh, sometimes it's a modified version of your Cyborg D, and often it's uh, doxyl velcade and dexamethasone and with high response for, rates. I mean, you get a good remission, you've been on it for six months, what do you what do you do next? Yeah, we give them velcade every other week and we maintain steroids. I maintain, but no imid uh, maintenance? Well, if they haven't been on an imid, we don't believe you should throw one in. And imids, by the way, we're talking here mainly about lenalidomide. Yeah, to be if, they've been on, if they have higher risk disease, we'll use four drugs up front with a, with a Revlimid added in and then we will keep them on Revlimid. So maintenance is, or continuous therapy is one of the more controversial areas in our field today and people have strong opinions about it. So, um, MD want to volunteer maintenance therapy, what do you think? So, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it is an important part of the continuous therapy paradigm and, and the way we approach it is maintenance is dictated by the risk of the patient. If you're a standard risk patient and you're... A and what do you mean by standard risk for the audience? So for me, that would be somebody who is low ISS stage or who has hyperdiploidy, uh, doesn't have plus 17 Plus hyperdiploidy, so assuming that not everybody's expert here. So plus three, plus five, plus seven chromosome, by fish. Chromosome. Yeah, right. chromosome abnormalities. So I think um, uh, for those patients, we would usually favor lenalidomide as a single agent as maintenance therapy. For the patients who have the 414 translocation, which is a smaller subset, but they appear to benefit from bortezomib both up front and in the main. And they're setting. a higher risk group for, again, for risk. the people who's not expert on them. Right, and then it. finally for the highest risk, the 17P deleted, 1416, or abnormal cytogenetics, uh, RVD up front, single transplant, and then RVD in the maintenance setting would be so, what we would So you're using continuous therapy but with three drugs in those patients too? Correct, correct. Well, again, if we just think about um, colleagues who can't offer that in other countries, is there an alternative to giving uh, Velcade and Revlimid continuously, do you think, Jeff? Is thalidomide useful? If you can only use lenalidomide, is that useful? Yeah, um, again, the highest risk patients do seem to benefit from bortezomib uh, maintenance. Um, thalidomide uh, as a maintenance therapy is, is uh, quite difficult to keep patients on. Um, there's a significant uh, rate of uh, treatment discontinuation by one year. And so if you can't actually uh, maintain patients uh, on the maintenance therapy, then they're not going to have sustained ongoing benefit from it. Um, lenalidomide maintenance um, does seem to uh, partially over, it does seem to impart some benefit uh, to patients with um, higher risk disease. Um, but pr probably not to the same degree uh, that it does for patients with lower risk disease or to the same degree probably that uh, bortezomib does. So, so in, uh, one second, so what do you do in your practice? You're giving lenalidomide or lenalidomide and bortezomib? For high risk patients? For standard risk and high risk? Um, for standard risk patients, uh, I use lenalidomide maintenance uh, post-transplant. Um, I. As Jim said, if I have a uh, patient who is not going to transplant and didn't get lenalidomide as part of their upfront therapy, if I selected a bortezomib-containing regimen, I generally continue the bortezomib as their maintenance, and I also use uh, once every two weeks. And my decision about steroids has to do with individual toler you know, tolerability. Uh, so you're using 
Belkin maintenance. What kind of maintenance is used in your transplant patients? Uh, Usually after transplantation, lenalidomide maintenance has been used. That's what I use. And when you use it, how long do you use it for? What, what Generally, state? I use it for minimum of two to three years. But if the patient is tolerating it and the patient continues to be in remission, I let them stay on it. But if the patient is having chronic, especially diarrhea with urgency, with a low dose lenalidomide, their quality of life is being impacted on. Mm -hmm. Then at the end of three years, I stop. And the, why three years? Because uh, the data from University of Arkansas, Bart Bologi has published that patients who were in CR at three years are the ones who made it to 10 years. So he had done an analysis and said three years was the key for in his data. So, so I felt when, like when keeping them. When for three years, irrespective of disease remission rate, whether does it matter to you if they're in CR or not in CR? First of all, you know, as long as they are on the maintenance therapy, when, no, when, you, and just, when you decide to stop, does it matter? Or, or? No, it doesn't matter. At the end of three years, if they are having side effects from the lenalidomide, then I can still withdraw it because if they relapse later on, which they may relapse because. And myeloma is also unusual. Some people could have that MGUS like small number. Just because they maintained it, it doesn't mean, you know, they're going to come back up. So that was not the key for me that they were able, I was able to maintain them for three years was the key point for me. And then deciding upon their quality of life. We can so change. Keith, if I can add something yeah, just sure. really quickly. So I think the question about our European colleagues and high risk is an interesting one because there is data from the UK suggesting that thalidomide in the high risk actually makes things worse. Right. We don't have that with Although that's the only one, one trial It is, it that, is. Yeah. But, but I think to speak to the, the lenalidomide chronic uh, diarrhea issue, there is data now, both from the, the British and actually our group presented at ASH 2014, the use of the cholesterol agent well call to, to, to treat lenalidomide-induced uh, uh, malabsorption, if you will. And it is incredibly effective. I mean, 85% of people get better. We are using better. it, too. Yeah. yeah it's so so let, me, uh, let me sort of summarize what we just heard, I think. So we've got most people still referring for transplant, but not everybody. And particularly if they're not, if they're in complete remission and are a bit reluctant to go to transplant, it's okay to, to delay that. Um, it sounds like everybody's using some form of maintenance. Is there any patients that you wouldn't use maintenance in? So it sounds like everybody, and it's a, a sort of mix of bortezomib, lenalidomide, and sometimes both together in a high risk patient. Yeah, I think one cautionary note in terms of who to do it on, I don't think we know whether it's really better in the high risk or standard risk, really. We don't have enough outcome data. I would data. agree with that. We don't know. Certainly the high risk. But let me, let me just, because this question comes up a lot about the duration. I heard from you three years. What, what do you guys do in terms of duration? I usually have the same sort of individual patient evaluation, but I usually do it in two years. But I, you know, but it's, at some point, I uh, step back and uh, try and reach some decision about uh, whether or not the, uh, the quality of life is being impacted in a way that uh, m makes it difficult to continue in the absence of a great deal of uh, data showing additional benefit by continuing it. You know, we assume it will add, you know, continued benefit, but we haven't proved it, and so you have to take the side effects. So that. last question about maintenance. I'm just going to push again on this issue of when you stop. So if you've been on for two years and you've still got an M spike of 0.7, do you stop or do you continue? I struggle with that in my practice. I treat to progression. Um, the high risk, the three drug I do for three years, and then I switch to Len. But everybody else, I treat to progression. Now, now Dr. Loniel, there's been some concern when you that if you stay on these drugs a long time, that bad things might happen to the bone marrow. Do you watch the MCV when you're doing that? Do you yeah. do you do regular marrows looking for fish change, or do you you don't think it's a big deal? Well, I I, um, I don't do any more than I would do in a regular post transplant patient who's also at risk for developing MDS. Good good point. Um, just to close up on...